Hi guys and welcome to a, another episode of Wisdom Wednesday. In today's video I'm going to be talking through a request from uh, a Patreon subscriber, uh, Noel, and he wants to know a little bit more about the force velocity curve as it relates to youth athletes and some ways of implementing. So interestingly he speaks about reading a blog from Eric Cressy about his progressions uh, for youth athletes. So in today's video I'm going to discuss mine. Uh, some basic recommendations I've got and some interesting thoughts I believe I bring to the table in terms of things that often aren't considered about the force velocity curve with youth athletes and uh, children. So uh, today's talk, more information on the force velocity curve for youth athletes, how to incorporate these activities, whether you're looking at physical education, strength conditioning or indeed sports coaching itself and what books, materials, etc. have influenced uh, my coaching. So my first question when anyone talks about the force velocity curve for youth athletes is, are we putting the car ahead of the horse? For example, should we care about how much our athlete can lift, how fast they can move, if the movement quality isn't there in the first place? Because to me, we don't really, shouldn't really be caring about how big that engine is if, for example, our ability to steer the car is poor. You wouldn't start learning your... Uh, driving tests by doing 70 miles an hour down the motorway, you obviously learn to control the vehicle at slower speeds first. And it's basically the same thing when it comes to youth athletes and the force velocity curve. Yes, it's nice to have some data, but movement quality is always paramount. And secondly, is force tolerance ahead of force production? Now, athletes get injured, whether it's young, old, um, because their ability to absorb forces is not as good as their ability to express it or sorry to phrase that another way if the forces that are being placed on you are greater than the forces you are physically able to tolerate you get injured with the current um, situation with corona what we're going to see and i have no doubt we'll see it in the premier league tonight is athletes who have become deconditioned aren't now able to tolerate the forces they once were but psychologically are used to for example playing 90 minutes of football, whatever, they're going to get injured because they haven't been able to recreate the force um, acceptance or tolerance type of activities that are going to get them injured. So, for example, it's very hard to recreate change of direction with cognitive fatigue, sharp decelerations uh, and accelerations when you've not got other players around you. Very easy to uh, add in the physical demands of that. You could literally just do shuffle, shuttle sprints, but... When you've not got another player chasing you down, you've not got your mind distracted by where the ball's going or where your eyes are, it's hard to recreate that level of stress. So before we even worry about power, we want some level of good movement quality. We want some level of stability. So for example, if we're talking about youth athletes, I've had experience where I've made youth athletes jump further just by improving their balance. Uh, the analogy I like is from Shane Fitzgibbon. Um, and he talks about if, for example, you're an athlete cycling or a young kid learning to um, ride a bike and they kept having to have their hands on the brakes. Would you tell them to push the pedals harder or would you say, look, just take your hand off the brake? Um, and giving, improving kids movement quality is like taking the hand off the brake. So we can, all, we can improve without even worrying about power. Um, and just because I say stability, strength, power doesn't necessarily mean we work on those in isolation. Uh, so for example, I would argue that a, something like a um, single leg squat, for example, yes, it's stability because it's on one leg. It's also quite high strength requirement as well. Um, so even though I use a lot of pyramids as my infographics, the reality is that that's just easy to conceptualize it. But you're always working on all qualities at the same time, just at differing levels. Even the co uh, coaching cues you give kids when it comes to their landing is going to affect the adaptation that you get out of it. Um, so again, stolen from Science of the Sport, this infographic, you tell a kid that you want a stiff landing, or for example, a cue I like is land as if you've got a biscuit underneath your heels, you don't want to break that biscuit. We're improving their ability um, to develop stiffness, which is what they're going to need for repeated plyometrics, stuff like drop jumps. Um, but equally, if we tell them to land quietly, we're developing their landing mechanics, their ability to... Um, land softly and reduce force. So there's reasons why we would want both of them. So the force velocity curve, you probably come across it on various different um, blogs, whatever. Um, 
just a quick explanation. If you haven't heard of it, we've got activities which are high force, low velocity. These are your heavy lifts. So as a power lifter, my maximal squat and deadlift, for example, is going to be at one end of the spectrum. Equally, me sprinting with my own body weight is going to be at the other end of the spectrum. And then you've got these categories in between. So you've got maximum force, minimal velocity, a slow moving 1RM, maximum velocity, minimal force, sprinting and then you've got strength speed which is basically lifting relatively heavy objects as fast as you can speed strength lifting relatively light objects as fast as you can with an acceleration phase so med ball throws plyometrics uh, ballistics so um, throwing a javelin as an example and then you've got peak power which occurs between 30 and 80 percent the more strength trained an athlete is so myself as a power lifter i'm going to hit peak power at higher levels of 1rm Less strength trained athletes are going to hit it at lower values. Um, that's a massive range. So, again, expose athletes to different ranges and find out what works best for them. An Eric Cressy quote I love, and Noel mentioned uh, that he'd come across uh, Eric Cressy's blog outlining his uh, progressions. He said, You can never be too strong, but you can be only strong. And that's what we want to avoid. Strength is massively important for kids because just by getting them stronger, we improve change of direction speed, we improve throwing velocity, kicking velocity. But all of a sudden you'll get to a certain level of strength and it doesn't transfer to sporting activities as well as we hoped. That doesn't mean stop doing it because it still provides injury resilience and t improves tissue tolerance. But it is something to think about. It's much easier, in my opinion, to get a coordinated athlete strong because it doesn't take any time at all to teach them the movement pattern than it is to get a strong athlete coordinated. Even myself as a power lifter, yes, I'd like to think I'm reasonably strong, but I also like to think I'm reasonably athletic, as you'll see if you've seen any of my calisthenics uh, content. I can, for example, human flag, uh, handstand push-up, ring muscle-up. I like to think that by having those strength qualities, but also keeping an element of movement and mobility and coordination, um, I've got the perfect platform to pick up athletic skills. And as this is the philosophy when I train youth athletes, give as many options to go into whatever sport you're choosing and still have a reasonable physical and coordinated base in order for doing this. So as I said, for youth athletes, get them strong, good things will happen, but make sure you're still working on other qualities at the same time. So as I said, if all you did was strength train, then you bias the force velocity curve towards high force activities. Uh, if all you do is sprint, then you bias the force velocity curve to velocity activities. We want to shift that curve up and to the right. So we're working on across that curve using heavy lifts, fast exercises and everything in between. So how do we incorporate this into strength and power? Uh, how do we incorporate strength and power activities into either strength and conditioning, PE, sports coaching? Now, it's easy to use strength and conditioning because if we've got, for example, strength and conditioning suite, we can just lift heavy weights with excellent technique. Uh, we can throw things for our uh, speed strength if we're throwing, for example, a medicine ball. Uh, for strength speed, again, trap bar jumps or heavier trap bar jumps, fine. Speed, we can go out and do some sprints. Now, I must say, with ideally, you want some kind of release phase with uh, speed strength or strength speed. You don't really want to be slowing down. So just doing your squats faster, mm, there's a deceleration phase. doesn't work as well. Um, P, are you really going to concern yourself with the force velocity curve in P? Probably not. Even at a GCC content, they're not going to be learning about this stuff. So it's going to be hard for you to crowbar it in. Sled drags, if you've got access to, yeah, great. Um, Again, you might use carry variations in PE. Again, unlikely, but still, you might do it. Sports coaching, you could chuck your carry variations into a warm-up, make it almost like an army-style fun game. Might be touching on max strength, maybe. I put question marks for strength, speed, and speed strength, because if anybody knows of any easy ways that don't require loads of equipment for hitting these qualities within PE or sports coaching, I'd love to know. Um, Plyometrics very easy to incorporate into PE and sports coaching. Uh, even with young kids, you can, you know, imagine you're jumping the river. Uh, imagine you're jumping up to Everest. You can play different games, which I'll get into in a second. Uh, chase games work great for developing speed. In fact, when I had Tom Green on the platform to perform podcast, he mentioned that he, just by having one group of athletes or kids play speed games, so even stuff like rounders, they improve their speed better than athletes or kids who were taken through the um, more technical side of sprinting. Now, this might have been to do with engagement. It might have been to do with driving intent from that competition. Not really sure. Um, interestingly, a research paper I saw this morning said that um, technical running, so your A skips, your B skips, etc., only contributes to 3% of overall sprinting speed, whereas power contributes to 31%. Again, if you want this paper, I'll dig it up and send it to you. Um, but basically, don't lose your mind focusing on um, mechanically efficient technique um, 
because some kids cognitively might not be ready for it. That's not me saying don't worry about technique, but it doesn't contribute anywhere near as much as we probably thought it would. Just because somebody looks mechanically pretty, for want of a better word, doesn't guarantee they're fast. But if they're fast, you can guarantee they're probably powerful. So plyometric pyramid. This is, plyometrics are easy to incorporate to improve power in youth athletes. Um, here's my model. Again, uh, a pyramid make, works nicely as a conceptualization, but the reality is that um, I would work all qualities at all times, just to varying degrees. My base layer would be the ability to accept force. So do you land well? Can you do this off a double leg and a single leg? Can you do it with some element of cognitive fatigue? So decision making. That is, in sport, we have always got decisions to make. Typically, you don't find many sports where you just land and that's it. Like maybe the end of gymnastics, possibly. Um, there's typically a decision to be made after. So even if we're introducing low levels of cognitive fatigue, so snap downs are a great example, um, where you basically stand up on your toes and snap down into an athletic position. You could literally have someone stand up tall and then snap down if you shout an even number and snap down and jump up if it's an odd number, something like that. Um, interestingly, research paper on ACLs out recently said that most ACLs happen for three mechanisms. One of them is balance after being knocked off balance after a header. So there's your sort of cognitive fatigue and physical qualities, um, and also uh, the balance after having had a shot. So just a couple of things to think about. So you want to be able to land on double leg, single leg, staggered stances, and maybe do that in combination uh, as well. Express force, so how high can you jump, how far can you jump. Reproduce force, so this is where we've got some kind of rhythm going. Um, so whether we just start that with low level um, just by jumping rope or whether we've got um, hurdle hops in different directions. Finally, the creme de la creme, reproducing force under fatigue. Plyometrics and jumping activities is obviously best done fresh. Um, but the reality is sport is going to require us to produce force when we're, fr uh, when we're fatigued as well. So whether that's cognitive so we've got a bit of decision making going on or whether that is uh, physically fatigued. Wouldn't recommend starting there, but definitely something to keep in mind because motor patterns change as we get fatigued. We want to make sure that, that we are still producing force as efficiently as possible. Uh, another interesting thought on the force velocity curve is this slide that I've stolen from James Baker's uh, eccentric summit. And interestingly, he places um, a lot of emphasis on eccentric loading. So how much force can you tolerate and accept? So as I said, movement competency is always king. Time under tension with body weight is another great concept I like. Good one you can steal is even something like a goblet squat, place a cup of water on top. All of a sudden, rather than boring athletes by counting three second tempo downwards, they're just worried about not spilling the drink. Um, this works great for engagement. Kids forget that their strength training, um, it just ticks so many boxes. Uh, jumping up to a box is always going to be less stressful than landing down. If you want to learn more about quantifying plyometric intensity, I'm going to have a blog on that very soon. Um, and finally, parkour and free running. The ability to coordinate your body in time and space, your landings, make a decision, your elements of cognitive fatigue, elements of metabolic fatigue, if it's long enough. That for me is what sport is. If you can, if you've improved athletes' coordination, their ability to reduce force and produce it and make a decision, then you are winning in my mind. Um, here's my framework. Happy to email this over. I'm not going to spend too long talking about it, but I like a bodyweight squat with flawless technique as well as a hip hinge pattern with flawless technique before we load it. Um, and again, I'm not going to spend too long on this, but this is my uh, framework that I've developed, if you will. So key take homes. If movement quality is on point, then we worry about force and velocity. If it's not, don't worry about force and velocity until the quality of the movement looks good. Force acceptance, in my mind, always one step ahead. So by that, as I said, I want it on one leg, double leg, with fatigue, uh, etc. Um, but I always, as I said, we're working all these qualities simultaneously, so force production and force acceptance. But, for example, the various different levels I've presented in my plyometric pyramid, you would almost be one or two levels up from force production, in my mind, anyway. Um, example games, so rocket tag's a great one. Um, it's like stuck in the mud, but when you get stuck, you sit down and squat. When you get freed, you blast up like a rocket. So you've got force production there, decision making as well. Um, it's just great. Cross the rhythm if we want to work on stability. So as I mentioned, that stability, strength, power paradigm. It's not that we do all the stability and then once we've done that, we do all the strength and we do all the power. It's that we're always working these qualities, but to differing degrees. A single leg squat or a pistol squat is a high level stability exercise, arguably strength. Um, but 
uh, where standing on one foot is stability, but it's very low level. So depending on where your athletes are at, you can easily integrate it um, and work these various, various different components. So materials that I found useful, Breck Clicker of Spider Fit Kids, if you're working with six to 10 year old athletes, unbelievable. If you get a youth athlete in your program that can, for example, bodyweight squat, push up position plank, skip rhythmically um, and hip hinge, then you're in a great place. And that's what Brett's program does, is designed to do, but also by improving the perceptual motor skills, which I also have a blog on and myself and Shane Fitzgibbon spoke at, at length in episode 10 of the Platforms Perform podcast. Materials for now, Spider Fit Kids is great. Kelvin Giles' Fight and Five is great. Child to Champion, probably my favorite course. So again, I've bombed a lot of information at you. Um, if you found that useful, please like and subscribe on YouTube and please share it so it can help spread the word and educate coaches and parents uh, alike if you've got any questions um, drop me a message via your preferred channel and i will catch you in the next wisdom wednesday video thank you for tuning in